The research I'm going to talk about began when I was running a trading desk on Wall Street. Um, I started out working for Goldman Sachs and ended up running a trading desk, a derivative trading desk for Deutsche Bank. I was fortunate enough during that period to be um, sort of splitting my time between Wall Street and um, uh, Rockefeller University, which is on the Upper East Side. Um, and it, it was a fascinating combination because up at Rockefeller, um, I came sort of uh, became aware of the work being done by Bruce McEwen um, and his lab, who were some of the first to map steroid receptors in the brain um, to um, study the effect of stress and glucocorticoids on the hippocampus. Um, and it was interesting because I was observing on Wall Street um, what I consider to be um, a phenomenon that hadn't been studied by economics, and I became increasingly convinced that it was worthy of scientific study. Because during, in particular, well, during bull markets, and in particular during um, uh, um, the dot-com bubble, traders on the floor um, and all along Wall Street had changed. They had started to display behavior that um, they were uh, euphoric, delusional. Uh, they had racing thoughts, diminished need for sleep. They seemed a lot hornier than they used to be. Um, and their appetite for risk expanded exponentially. And the risk-reward trade-offs of the, the positions they were putting on deteriorated. Um, I was later to learn that these are sort of classical symptoms of mania, but I didn't know that at the time. Now, the important thing about what I was observing was that it's not that Wall Street selects for this kind of person. It's not like that's what people are like on Wall Street. These people were not like this before the bubble, and they weren't like that afterwards. When the bubble popped, they were like people with a hangover. They couldn't believe they'd just blown their savings on internet schemes that had no earnings, for example. So something was happening to them when they were making above average profits that was changing them. Um, and I was relatively immune to the internet bubble because, I, I don't know, for some one reason or another, I never bought into it. But I had, on previous occasions in my own trading, entered periods of, ex of above average profits where then I was expecting above average bonus. And the effect is extraordinarily powerful. There's some of the most powerful feelings I've ever experienced, and every trader will say the same thing. When you have to understand that I'm going to describe three different levels of data that go into this, the, the research we're doing. The first is my own experiences, and it really tethers everything that I do. The second is research with animals and athletes, and then third is our own research on a trading floor in London. But of that, the most important, for me at any rate, was my own experiences and what I observed in other traders, because it is a type of field work that isn't being done anywhere. There's important data, observations, that need to be made on Wall Street of what happens to traders in this environment. And that's not being reported anywhere else. And I guess if you haven't been there, you don't know about it. You have to appreciate that this environment is more powerful than anything I've ever experienced. I haven't come close to it. Because it's not only the money. I mean, people come out of business school, they get a job, and what they're hoping when they're after the first couple of bonuses to be able to afford to buy a two-bedroom apartment for themselves and their, their partner. But you start making big amounts of money. I mean, I had one kid on my desk a couple of years after I left. He made $800 million. So probably got paid over $100 million for that. So that is a case of someone who went from thinking, maybe about a two-bedroom apartment, to picking out a beach house in the Hamptons, <coughs> thinking that in a couple of years, he won't be flying public uh, airlines anymore. He'll have his own jet. And on the downside, on a really bad year, you know, you can have bankers pulling their kids out of private school. So it's very rare to have an environment in which you can step up or down a full social class in the space of a single year. And that's incredibly powerful. Um, besides the money, the information flows onto a trading floor are add to the power, and this may sound real, but how real the environment is. When something happens in the world, People on a trading floor find out about it probably before the CIA, probably before the prime minister or the president. Every news service in the world feeds into Wall Street. And it's the thing I personally miss the most, is feeling that I'm at the nerve center of the world, where there's just this electric buzz on the floor of news coming in. And these, this is an environment that's very, very difficult to resist. Um, so 
I guess the, I'll start out by saying then, so that these feelings that come over you, the traders aren't born to feel them. It happens when they're making an above average profit and it goes away with the profits. Um, secondly, I was very curious about what was behind this and I began to feel, become convinced that there was, it was a chemical that was driving this behavior. It wasn't um, game theoretic, as some economists will tell you. It wasn't rational, of course, like you know, there was just a bunch of new information that was very promising. This really felt chemical, and I was wondering what that chemical was. The other fact um, that I noticed at the time was that women seemed relatively unaffected by the frenzy surrounding the dot-com bubble, and in fact, in general, on, on the bubbles that, that I've experienced on Wall Street. So those, I thought, were pretty interesting facts, and I wanted to find out what this chemical was, because it's sort of the holy grail in economics and finance to figure out what is causing financial market instability. We know the terms irrational exuberance, irrational pessimism, or Keynes' older term, animal spirits, but no one's ever really known what they were. So I became convinced that really what economics and finance needed was field work. Um, because in most biological sci studies, you begin with an observation in the field. Robert Sapolsky goes to Kenya and observes that a lot of subordinate baboons are dying from peptic ulcers. That's curious. Why is this happening? You take the fact back to Rockefeller, and they start looking at the effect of glucocorticoids on well, the stress response and what it does to the body. We don't really have that in economics. There isn't really a lot of field work being done with those observations then being taken back to the lab and then the molecular work or the behavior work being done in the lab to figure out what's causing those. Um, this, when it comes to studying hubris in the financial markets or what we call exact irrational exuberance, I think they're the same thing. We're particularly lucky in that we don't have a lot of the conceptual difficulties you have in other areas like politics. Because in other areas, you have to define your dependent variable. And it can be very difficult defining hubris, giving it a clinical diagnosis. It can be very difficult within studies of um, hormones, for example, defining aggression, defining status-seeking behavior, dominance behavior. Those require behavioral observation, they require questionnaires, and every time you use tools like that, there's a lot of noise in it, your stats weaken, the good journals won't publish them. But the beauty about finance is that the data is so hard. You've got P&L, which is profit and loss. You've got position size, you've got trade frequency, you've got volatility weighted risk uh, measures, you've got the volatility of the market. These are all hard numbers. There's no reporting bias, they come from the back office. And that means that when you put that up against physiological measurements, like hormone levels, uh, readings from the ANS, you get two sets of hard data. We've done three studies now on the trading floors in the city. And I think of 12 results that we've reported, every single one of them has been significant to three decimal places. And the effect sizes have been large. And a good part of that, I think, besides the fact that we're on to something, is because we have such clean data. So this is a world that desperately needs this research but it's one that can actually lend itself to a very scientific um, approach. Now, so the question I did was, I, I want, was there a bull market molecule? What was this chemical high that was driving traders to take on too much risk and risk with um, terrible risk reward trade-offs? Well, given the environment I've just described to you that's so information rich, which ha such high rewards, and more importantly, when you're making above average profits, you're getting unexpected reward. You can see that all of those things are situations in which dopamine is released. So it's entirely possible that these traders on a roll are just getting an increasing hit of dopamine and that maybe bubbles can be explained through classic um, addictive behavior. Maybe they habituate to the risk limits and want to take it up more. Um, that's one possibility. It's possible that you can get this, this behavior that I was observing just through the classical mechanisms of dopamine and addiction. Um, the other natural chemical to look at, of course, was testosterone. Um, and in the work done on athletes uh, of using anabolic steroids, um, Pope and Katz did um, notice a fairly high incidence of manic behavior in people taking anabolic steroids. Unfortunately, their research, you're talking about super physiological doses of testosterone. Um, what is more likely is that it's a combination of the both, the two of them. 
because we do know from a limited number of studies that rising levels of testosterone will increase dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which is an area that's been um, correlated with irrational risk-seeking in financial tasks. So the molecule I was investigating then was testosterone. It's sort of a difficult molecule to deal with scientifically because it's shrouded with myth and cliché. And even the founding scientists working with the molecule weren't, you know, didn't do much to dispel that, those clichés. Brown Sigard, who was one of the first to experiment with administered forms of androgens, mashed up a witch's brew of guinea pig and dog <coughs> testicles and, in, and swallowed it himself. And reporting the results to a, um, an audience, scientific audience in Paris, he said that it was a rejuvenating elixir. And that just that morning, he was 74 at the time, reported that just that morning he'd paid a visit to his wife. <laughs> and, so it, and then when they finally, um, uh, the Nobel Prize went to a German, I think his name was Butenland, for synthesizing testosterone from cholesterol. In his acceptance speech, this was, you know, someone practicing hard medicine, hard science, in his acceptance speech to the Nobel Committee, he said, gentlemen, this is pure dynamite. I mean, so <laughs> it's, it's hard to separate the sort of hype from the serious science, but it's an extremely powerful molecule. It affects, like most steroids, it has receptors in almost every, every nucleated cell in your body. Um, so that when these steroid levels like testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, rise and fall, they're changing almost every aspect of your body. Your metabolic rate, your growth rate, um, the shape of your body, your lean muscle mass, the amount of hemoglobin in your blood which carries the oxygen. Those are the two properties that athletes are after when they abuse anabolic steroids, the lean muscle mass and the hemoglobin. Um, and while it's never been just the real aside, I'm, I would be willing to bet that some of the foremost achievements in mountaineering, I'm not going to mention any names, that have been done without oxygen tanks, I would suspect are being done on testosterone. I mean, usually when you climb Everest, you've got an army of Sherpas carrying oxygen tanks. But a couple of people have gone it without oxygen tanks. I'm just wondering how many tubes of testosterone gel equal like an army of Sherpas <laughs> with oxygen tanks. Because you've got this huge hemoglobin buildup. Um, for my purposes of our studies, we're more interested in its effects in the brain. Steroids um, cross the blood-brain barrier and have um, receptors throughout the brain. And testosterone is known to increase confidence and um, appetite for risk. So the model we borrowed, I became aware of at Rockefeller. And it's a beautiful model. Um, and it's odd that it's not known within economics. It's called the winner effect. It started out as an obser a statistical observation that an animal that's just won a fight or a competition for turf is statistically more likely to win the next round of competition. And they controlled for the size of the animal, its motivation, and a pure winner effect still remains. They looked for a mechanism driving this, and what they found was that when two males go into a competition, their testosterone levels rise, that after all being the allotted role for this, this hormone. Um, the winner comes out of the encounter with even higher levels of testosterone, the loser with, even, with lower levels. And I think that makes sense from an evolutionary point of view. If you've just lost a fight, go off in the woods and nurse your wounds, don't look for another fight. But if you've just won, you've bumped up a rank in the social hierarchy, there's probably going to be more challenges to your newfound rank. And so testosterone rises. The animal goes into the next round of competition with already elevated levels of testosterone, and that gives him an edge to win again. And this can start feeding on itself. And I think that this is the physiological substrate underlying winning and losing streaks in sports. It's not just that the athlete is, is like psyched out or you know, in the zone. There's something physiological going on. He's, he's accessing his energy stores more freely. He's got larger um, lean muscle mass, more hemoglobin, depending on the, on the, the amount of time between competitions. Um, so this is a beautiful, they now, that's the sort of standard explanation for why the winner effect exists in animals. Now, how far can this go? This is a beautiful mechanism, but steroids have got a, what they call an inverted U-shaped dose response curve. In other words, at low levels of them, you can, you'll perform quite poorly on any, any cognitive or mental task because you hear low arousal, low energy levels, whatever. As levels of these hormones rise, your performance um, improves until you get to the peak. And if you cross that peak and start sliding down the downside, higher levels of testosterone no longer have these beneficial effects. They can make you take too much risk and risk with bad risk-reward trade-offs. 
So in animals, they've noticed that when testosterone is a lot rise um, beyond this peak level, um, the animals start to patrol areas that are too large. They pick too many fights. They neglect parenting duties. And they spend too much time out in the open. So they suffer increased <coughs> rates of predation. And I thought this was the perfect model for what was going on on Wall Street. Traders put on a trade. They make above average profit. Their testosterone levels rise. Their confidence increases. Their appetite for risk increases. They put on an even bigger trade. And on it goes until eventually they've gone over top of this dose response curve and they're putting on trades in ridiculously large size with terrible risk reward trade offs until they eventually blow up. And that's exactly what happens on Wall Street. And so that was the model that I became convinced was the thing that was driving irrational exuberance and was giving these traders this feeling that was so accurately described by Tom Wolf when he said they felt like masters of the universe, or um, Stephen Lewis called it. That you come to feel like big swinging dicks. Um, very accurate. Um, we did, a, we did a, as I said, three studies on Wall Street. I'll just give you two findings. This is one where we looked at um, the effect of whether these traders, in fact, had higher levels of testosterone when they made an above average profit. And in fact, they did. That correlation tells you nothing about which way the causation is going. So what we looked at instead was their testosterone levels in the morning versus their PL, that's profit or loss, in the afternoon. And of the traders in this study, these are their P&L, the amount of money they made on days when their testosterone levels were low in the morning relative to their median levels during the study. And these are their afternoon P&L when their testosterone levels were high. As you can see, it's an extraordinarily powerful effect. It's a full standard deviation difference. And for some of these traders, that added up to a million pounds at the end of the year if you were to annualize this effect. Um, so this is an extraordinarily powerful result. Um, in a later study, we looked at a, a surrogate marker of prenatal androgen exposure. There's sort of an interest in medicine right now to look at markers that might predict or measure um, the prenatal steroid environment as a predictor of future problems like prostate cancer. Um, and there's a model known as the organizational activational model of androgens, according to which the more testosterone you, expo you were exposed to in the womb, it sort of organizes your physiology, so it develops these androgenic circuits. Testosterone then goes quiescent until puberty, and then when testosterone comes rushing back in, it activates these circuits. And your sensitivity later in life to changing levels in testosterone in your blood is correlated with how much testosterone you are exposed to in the, in the womb. And this is a plot showing um, the surrogate marker of these traders' exposure to prenatal testosterone versus how sensitive their trading results were to changes in their testosterone. You can see it's not a bad fit. Um, I won't go into any other results because um, the rest of them are more on stress hormones than our testosterone. But this was great preliminary data showing that this hormone was having an enormous influence on these traders. And for the purpose of this talk, that's all I want. That's, I think, uh, enough. Um, so, what we need in the financial world to dampen these um, massive swings in risk preferences, we need risk management and compensation schemes to push against these biological waves that build up. But unfortunately, what we've got in the city is the worst of both worlds because we've got risk management that ups risk limits during bull markets. Traders that are on a roll are told, you know, you're doing really well. Increase your size. We're taking your risk limits up. And the bonus payments, which are based on single year returns, encourage people to roll the dice. So, because you don't have to give back. If you make 500 million one year and get paid, you know, whatever, 100 million, 80 million, and you lose 500 million the next, you don't have to give it back. So we've got risk management and compensation schemes that are actually exaggerating the biology rather than leaning against it. So what we desperately need are risk management and compensation schemes in the city that recognize the existence of these biological feedback loops. And I've only talked about one of them here. There's other ones that exist within stress hormones that cause the traders to become irrationally risk averse during the crash, which is the last thing you want. And that's why the state generally has to step in in a crash and buy the risky assets because the traders will no longer do it. What we need is risk management and compensation schemes that are leaning against these biological waves. But unfortunately, we're being um, 
hogtied in our ability to think that way because um, we've inherited this idea of a mind-body split from Descartes and Plato. And that may sound like I'm taking up a, way, a step way up into the, the stratosphere, but it's important to realize that in economics, we have a mind-body split as pure as anything ever contemplated by Descartes and Plato. We have a pure mind that's, that's rational. It's like a, we're walking around with a supercomputer in our head, and there's absolutely no recognition within economics that the body has an enormous influence on the decisions we make. And if we go back to the beginning of this tradition, there was Aristotle who did not buy into that at all. He was one of the first biologists, and he recognized the effect of the body on the way we think. And in his ethics and in his politics, he thought very productively about how you design institutions bearing in mind the biology of the participants. And I think that's what, where we have to go, because I don't know how you conceive of policy based on rational choice theory when the behavior of the people involved has such a large biological and hormonal component. Another area where you have this problem is thinking about how to deal with obesity. I mean, they're applying rational choice theory to policies to address obesity. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. So I'll end with just an anecdote. There, were one, there was one economist who really understood the extra-rational forces in our economic life, and that, of course, was Keynes. He referred to them as animal spirits. He didn't know the biology behind animal spirits, but he kind of understood the, their import. And his friend Bertrand Russell was sort of an arch-rationalist, and if you're alive today, he would buy into rational choice theory. And he said to Keynes once, politics is carried on irrationally, and the answer to that problem is to start carrying it on rationally. And Keynes just said, you know, conversations along this line are really quite boring. <laughs> I, would, I think I'll just end on that note, because not only is rational choice theory wrong, but discussions along those lines... They're just, this is boring. <laughs>